thought, I just thought, you know, there's a lot of stuff going on with, uh, you know, with how bad the books are nowadays and the modern stuff. So it's like, you know, sitting around and complaining about all the bad stuff. Yeah, I mean, that can be fun roasting them and everything. But, you know, a lot of people do that. Who's out there actually promoting something worth reading? Who's out there talking about like, hey, here's something good and you should check it out. I thought maybe we have that, that's the tack we could take with this is like kind of, you know, instead of steering people away from the bad stuff, which is important, we could also try to maybe steer them towards some good stuff instead. All right, folks, welcome. Another comic talk. That's right. Comic book talk with here. We're going to, why is it great with this guy? James Mealy's back with me. We're talking about single issues that, you know, you really kind of like take a look at, right? Because, I mean, it's easy for us to pile on other stuff. You'll probably hear me do it not so long, right? Don't take long. But it's not going to do us a whole lot of good if that's all we do and we don't try to point you to some great stuff. So, James, thanks for doing this again, my friend. It's awesome to have you with me and we're doing this. We always have a good time. This is what we're here for, man. Got to get some positivity going. There's a lot of negativity and a lot of it well-deserved, but, man, we need some positivity, too, so let's bring some positive. Well, we're not going to waste any time, too. Let's get right to the fun stuff, right? Because it's just it's all about the comic books, and you chose Fantastic Four 267, which, ironically enough, I think I sold during the pandemic. I actually think I had this run from, like, the 240s to, like, the 275s area, whatever, and bundled those babies up and was like wow all right let's do it so yeah 267 some really good stuff comes out of this book so 67 from night from 1984 this is shortly after the secret wars this is right after she hulk has joined the team so kind of a lot of stuff is going on a lot of moving parts but yet if you take this issue on its own it's it's a great little uh story because i think what this this issue i mean despite how the cover makes you think it's all going to be this big action fest you know it's a Mr. Fantastic versus Dr. Octopus is going to be this huge battle. It's really not. It's It really focuses on the family aspect of this team. You know, they've, they've been called mm-hmm. Marvel's first family for a reason. And this issue to me is like a key of why they say that about that, that about that book. So I thought it'd be great, a great little, a uh, great little number for people to check out that isn't too expensive. And uh, again, just a great, a great story could be taken on. And you'll see little threads that are going through from issues before and issues after, but just taken on its own. This issue is a great little uh, tale. All right. And all by it's, itself. it's, this is uh, John Byrne all the time and all the way writer artist. He's the man right now on this book. So yeah, if you like this, we, I, I, I just keep dropping John Byrne's name. It seems like, cause he's like a show here and a show there. Next thing you know, if you guys are not connected to who John Byrne is, you need to be. So, uh, all right. So let's get into this book a little bit. Uh, Fantastic four, two sixty seven. Here's our first look, and obviously you see that uh, beautiful green-eyed She-Hulk staring back at us with some uh, story here. So uh, catch us up, James. It gets you up the page. Basically, catches you up on uh, what's been going on, and you got She-Hulk starting out here. Basically, you know, this is a great story. I thought it was a, a nice, uh, a nice uh, tale that, even though it's connected to a larger story, it can be t- taken on its own in a great little done-in-one story of its own. Uh, it's a great little uh, tale. Uh, right here, we got is uh, it's right after She-Hulk is doing the team. Uh, Sue is in the hospital. She's suffering from some kind of radiation due to her, their, their exposure in the negative zone. It's, he, then they're worried about it affecting the baby. Here's She-Hulk talking about that. She goes, "When I asked the thing to take, when the thing asked me to take his place after we finished our cosmic battle, I guess I looked upon it as a chance to, to uh, legitimate myself. Ever since the transfusion from my cousin Bruce transforming into the She-Hulk, I've been something of a joke in the public eye. Kind of funny when you think about how that series went. Which, just by the way." Even becoming a full-time Avenger only helped, only helped a little. I hope I, by being accepted by the Fantastic Four uh, would would be the clincher, not to mention an honor and a whole lot of fun. Instead, I find myself standing here with all my colossal strength absolutely useless, just a big green ornament to this gathering of intellects because she's standing here with all like some of the smartest guys in, in the, the Marvel Universe trying to figure out what's wrong with Sue, and she's seeing how my power, all this power I have, it means nothing because it's of no use in this situation. It, it, it takes brain power, and that's not me. And so I just thought it was a nice, uh, you know, here, I may have been a hotshot lady lawyer in California, but compared to this group, I'm a kindergarten dropout. You see, so there is, she's feeling, she's feeling kind of useless. She's just joined the team, and she feels useless in what they're having to deal with right now. So I just thought it was a great little character moment with, uh, with She-Hulk right at the very beginning here of, of her start on the team. And uh, you know, like I said, this this whole thing has like the family feel. We really want to get the family feel of the of, of the uh, the FF in this story, which is why I like it so much. So if we go to the next, 
I fade, we can see even more of that. You know, Reed, Reed is talking with some of the, the uh, other uh, big brains of the Marvel Universe, and they tell him, you know, we need Otto Octavius. He is the, like, the most knowledgeable guy on radiation. We need him in here. So they go to get him. So Reed's him in and hawing because he's like, he doesn't want to get him because he knows he's Dr. Octopus. But at the same time, I got to do everything I can to save my wife and my unborn child. And so he goes in to see Sue and he goes, shouldn't be gone for too long. This one, this one last expert is nearby. And then Sue comes in. There's more to it than that, isn't there? I know you too well, darling. You're trying to keep something from me. No, Susan. It's just that I read. Don't, please. Somehow there's something going on that you don't like. Possibly something dangerous. I know. I know there's nothing I can say that will stop you doing what you must feel you, you must. But be careful. Be very careful, Reed. I will, my darling. Nothing can stop me from coming back to you and our child. My love. And then like, you see Reed right here. She sounded so weak, so terribly frail. I've never known her slips. I've never seen her slip so low. So you see right there is even even in the condition she's in, she, she, she knows him so well that she knows something's bothering him about what he's about to do. And that's, again, the whole family aspect. These people, they're not just like teammates hanging out once in a while. It's, this is truly a family. They understand each other in a way that's deep and meaningful. And, and you see that right here in this, this beautiful little few panels here with him and him and Sue in this great touching moment of, of you know, their, their love and their connection to each other. Agree. Just it really, really was great stuff. So, all right. So Reed goes. He goes off and he and he gets Doctor Octopus. He 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 appeals to Otto Octavius at first with with like compassion, like you know, please help me, my wife, my unborn child. We need your help, Doctor Octavius. And he agrees to help. On the way back, as they're heading back to the hospital, you know, Reed is talking things over with o Octavius, and he sees a billboard of Spider Man from the, from the Daily Bugle, and it unnerves his 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 fragile ego mind and at the same time they're trying to move octopus's arms to a, a safer location and this is what happens as a result his, his seeing the spider-man image sets him off and it, it just that the arms go crazy you can see how dangerous these things are even without him in command of them and it just shows you how how, how powerful he truly is you know and uh it, it, it's just a great scene this, this is where we see some of the good action of octavius's arms and it, it all leads up to, of course, he catches up to, to Reed, and then Reed ends up fighting them and losing at first. And then Octavius, you know, this the more mild-mannered guy, go, gives way to Dr. Octopus. Dr. Octopus is back once again. And so that's when we can come to uh, this next part here where Reed is fighting with the uh, with, with the arms himself. And I just love, I, I, I love how he's... I, analytical while fighting his life against uh, Octavius arms in this next page. I will say here. that uh, this would have been great to have in one of the movies as, as a way of, of illustrating sort of that struggle between the machine and the, the, the scientist part of Doc Ock where it's like, you know, even the machine itself when yes. it's separated from him is it, cause it seemed like that's, that would have been a very interesting uh, element of uh, dealing with that. So I love this. I well, love what, this. What, what this shows so. is the arm, the arms will act not necessarily, not even just on his conscious level, but also on a subconscious right. level. So he's like complete, it's, it's yeah. very dangerous character here, whether he's conscious of it or not his arms are still dangerous and and that's what reed finds out here as he goes you know glass something must have triggered his psychosis but what surely only spider-man could of course it must have been one of those wretched daily bugle posters you know so he knows what's caused octavius to lose it and he goes he goes these arms are taxing the limit of my ductility they've got i've got to tether myself so i can fight my elastic body has been a tremendous bonus in my scientific work and in our battles against evil, but I've never had to deal with an unliving analog to my powers. And see, and so it's like he's fighting against something is just as, as like, you know, bendable and movable and, 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 and flexible as he is. So he's, he's fighting something that's like almost like a dark version of himself. It's, it's, it's not alive. And I, I love I love that land with him wrapping slowly slow, right, right, right around the arm trying to pull them. I just I love the way this is showing you, you know, his powers are being taxed to their limit fighting these arms. You know, he's fighting he's actually fighting a foe that's giving him, you know, uh, a lot of trouble that that uh, you know normally he wouldn't have fighting just about anybody else. 
Yeah, it's a very, very dynamic look at Reed's power that a lot of people don't take in mind because they have a very generic version yeah. of Mr. Stretchy Guy. But that, uh, like you said, that bottom right panel where his arms are like wrapping around and then grabbing hold of the tentacle. Very, very, very cool. Really like that part. And the way, he, and, then, and then the third panel when he anchors himself, that's another one that shows you just the. Uh... So what happens is, of course, Octopus eventually gets his mind together and he, 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 he says, you know, Dr. Octopus puts his back, you know, I'm with the arms and he goes, and he tries to take Reed. And so Reed's like, he's fighting him. He's like, how can I, how can I stop him? I know. And he goes, I got it. The manual control. And so he uses his hands and stretches them down to where the controls on the chest are. And he makes it so the arms can't move anymore. And you can see Octopus just like totally flips out about it. He goes, it's quite a strain holding these, these control dials stationary, especially the arms at extension. He goes, I'll, I'll, I'll unhand you, Octopus, but first you're going to listen. I came to you with good faith, Octopus. There was no pride involved. No need on my part to prove any superiority to you, intellectually or otherwise. In this field, you are clearly my better. It costs me nothing to admit. And here he's just reading all of the inner dialogue here of an innocent woman and her unborn child or their uh, mercy octopus uh, if you help them. Um, James's audio kind of stopped working there for a second. Um but yeah, just a great illustration of Reed kind of like buckling Octopus in on himself so he really can't uh, push back and he kind of forces him to make a decision. Like, what are you going to do now? I, it's not, it, I'm setting aside my ego. I'm setting aside my sort of uh, my personality of, of what people think of me. You know, what are you willing to do? Exactly. Can you hear me? Exactly. Okay, you know, Reed's yeah. here. Yeah. So uh, he, he, he's. He's trying to trying to reach it where before he reached octopus with compassion when he was more docile. Finally, Reed convinces. And as they're heading as they're heading back, we get this moment here, with Alicia, which he goes, "It can't have ended like this." And then just not family. And this is a time for family. Alicia, after all the effort and through all the life and death battle, all the cosmic adventures across the universe, time and now. Now this, something that's so, to cost us so much. Try to be strong. We will need your strength now that Ben is no longer with you. We must gather our strength together. We are all are a family. And as you said, we must survive as a family. So, you know, he, he we, it shows up with Octopus. He comes in. He's talking to, to people. He's talking to like, you know, and no one's giving him a strange. He's like, what's going on? Why won't someone tell me what is going on here? And so finally... Does here, and in the final page of the issue, we get we get what all comes down. Devastating. Right? Reed talking with the doctor, and he tells he goes, "Su she 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 she's fine. I'm afraid she lost the baby a little over thirty minutes to go." And I love the way Byrne does this image, all shining a little image, like like an like an encompassing darkness closing in on Reed Richards. And uh, the FF, and I way that ends in that way. It, it it really drives home the emotion of the scene. You know, he's went through all this stuff. He's he's his 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 ethics working with Octopus and all this other stuff he's done, all for nothing, because in the end the baby dies anyway. As Johnny mm -hmm. said, it's a normal everyday thing that happens to people every day. You know, the FF is fantastic. You know, life for death adventures and and got away with it without anything going wrong and parents and and it just takes them right how again this this is the way I said the family aspect of this issue weighs in to to everything that the book is about you know it's not about it's not about beating up bad guys it's not about scientific research and all it's about a family and that's what this issue really drives home and to me it's it's one of the best issues of burns run uh like i said if you if you've read the the whole story there's all kinds of threads going through it but even if you don't you just you just read this issue on its own it's a great story excellent stuff excellent stuff by john Byrne. this is why he's a legend this is why his ff run is so revered this is the kind of storytelling we don't see anymore in the comics this is the kind of 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 gravitas that is missing and i just love this issue i love that they shown the family side to the ff so so strong and so uh poignantly it's a it's great little tale yeah i couldn't agree more and i want to go back to this other page too because um 
and you know, folks, we are having some audio issues, but I, I really want to touch on what James was saying too, to make sure that it didn't get missed. And that was, you know, he's reading the dialogue and the bubbles of about the family and Johnny hugging Alicia and all that kind of stuff. And you see, you know, that the third section down where, you know, uh, burn pulls back and draws, you know, them from far away. It's like distant. They're, they're being moved from the problem. They're, the helplessness is being conveyed before we get to that climactic ending when you realize that it just, it just, it turned, it turned sideways. It went, it went badly in, in sadness. So uh, just a great, powerful, resonating story. Um, something that, like you said, James, we don't, we don't get this much. It's, we just don't get stuff like this very often emotion. anymore. It's filled with drama. It's filled with everything that you would love to see. And, and, and you know, and, and it just shows exactly, exactly, you know, they 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 are missing today is, is how to tell a story like that. They, you know they think you could never see a story like that done today. It would never be done the way that Fern did it here with so much human emotion, and that's really what's mm. lacking, I think. And but, but again, this is the FF. They're a family, and that's what really comes across in this story. You know, the fight with Octopus is almost like doesn't even matter. The cover lets you think, it makes you believe, like oh, it's going to be this big battle with Reed versus Doctor Octopus, and it's it's really not. It's really the human drama, the family drama of the FF dealing with an, an everyday problem that a lot of people in the real world face and having to come to terms with it in a way that we all do, you know, and all their powers, all, all their, all their, their abilities mean nothing. You no, know, she hulks thing in the beginning when she's talking about how she feels useless because all, all her power means nothing in this situation. And that's what I think really drives this story is it shows you that you know, being a superhero doesn't mean you can come. There are still things in the world, everyday little things that can still trip you up just as much as it can a normal person about that story. It it really plays to the heart of, of what, you know, what it means to be a, 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 a human rather than just, a, you know, superhuman or human. It matter. In the end, you're all human. And that's what I love about that story. It's absolutely great. Such a great recommend. Um, yeah, the John Byrne run is definitely a high recommend from us both. You can't go wrong with some of these issues. This is a very, very poignant issue just kind of mixed in where this is how you would get social commentary in comic books. Because you hear these creators say these things like, I don't know what you were reading. It was always there. Sure, it was always there, but it was grounded in a very just real life happens there are struggles and it makes these characters so relatable on so many levels. Such a great choice. Such a great choice. So uh, exactly. I chose, exactly. I, I chose an Alan Moore book, which, well, it may not surprise a couple of you know that I've gone back and been rereading some Alan Moore to prepare for a, a swamp thing. Horror movie evidently is going to be in the works. Uh, Alan Moore's work was referenced. So I'm hoping that we can actually get something that actually might be uh, interesting. I will admit that I'm not as familiar with some of their other efforts to adapt Swamp Thing, but going back to this issue, a um, uh, very, very simple uh, issue in a lot of ways because uh, Alan Moore is you know, only an issue or so into things. And what he's going to do in this issue um, is um, redefine everything. He's going to change the game, so to speak, of what Swamp Thing is. Uh, the origin, uh, give you a different perspective. And obviously the tone and look and feel of the book, everything about it all is what gets changed here. And I have to be honest, this is something that I had not read in a long, long time. Uh, had not, um, I, I haven't owned in a long, long time, to be honest. Like it's one of those things where, uh, yeah, just, uh, just a really, just a fun book. Um, in that regard. And I'm just really glad that I was able to uh, revisit it. Um, let me get to my, let me pull up something here real quick. So I make sure I read the right dialogue and not have to try to zoom in. Cause that's, that's the trick with my, uh, my technical side. Um, so uh, beautiful, beautiful work all the way around, whether it be uh, art inside or out, you're just going to have just, just incredible stuff. I think, um, uh, all, well, all I want to say right here on this on, on that cover right there, I I love yep. I love the inking by was it John Tolberin? He is like mm -hmm. to me one of the, like one of the premier 
uh, underappreciated horror artists of comics. I mean, his 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 work is 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 just incredible. The detail he puts in things, the 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 textures, the you know, like like you can see, like I love how he has the 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 swamp thing almost all in shadow. Yet in mm-hmm. the in the in the background, you have the guy up against the wall, and you can see where the light source is coming from, and you can see like the window where the light is from, and yet the, it's completely backlighting. The, uh, the Swamp Thing and making him almost like a shadowy figure. I just love the way he did that beautiful, beautiful work. So, And this is the first issue of a few of them where you're going to find is really the Swamp Thing is not the star of his own comic book. So you've got about this issue and then three or four issues where the story and the meat of the story is that they trusted Alan Moore to flush all of this out. And we're going to learn a whole lot of information without having to put sort of a uh, tights and capes perspective on things. Like like Swamp Thing is literally not active in most of the pages, but we're learning mass amounts of information about him through these other characters. Again, just the brilliance of real writing. So right out of the get-go, we get our introduction here of uh, the story that we're going to learn, which is uh, Jason Woodrue. And we're going to have, we're, we're going to teach you the audience so you'll know who everybody is. You don't have to know a whole lot. He's going to take you. And I will say, I do love the idea of, quote, it's called the anatomy lesson. And we are going to quite literally go on an, uh, an autopsy, so to speak. So here in the last issue, they had um, shot Swamp Thing and been able to encase him in this, in this ice. So in doing so, they think that they've caught something and now they can experiment and learn and uh, basically hijack some of the science for their own benefit. And uh, they bring in, um, they bring him in, right? They bring in Jason Woodrue as, as their advisor, right? So what is he going to bring to the table, right? He's a genius scientist. Okay. So here they're giving you little pieces of the stories about who we think Swamp Thing is because we've had 20 something issues like who was Swamp Thing, right? So we've had 20 issues. We've had over a year, year and a half. He was once a human being and like, well, his name was Alec Holland. He was a doctor like yourself. He was experimenting. Here's what he was doing. So they're going through all the stuff before they mentioned the wife. So that's what you see there in the middle. And I love the fact that he placed the art in his head telling the story it was just unique it was just interesting and dynamic with how they do things as you say yeah, with the way I, they I, color I that too but both this page and the previous one you know the, the layout yeah. design for the panels and and the, the mm-hmm. one before this one yeah the, the anatomy yeah. lesson page all of those it's like that's something i've noticed not just in this issue but in a lot of moore's work is is how the, they're laid out it's, it's like it's like he takes a very key key note of like how something should be laid out to give maximum you know um uh, impact yeah and steve Bissett is just hitting a home run with this issue and i know um i may say his name wrong is it rich veach is it veach is that how you say his name rich veach vetch i think vetch vetch okay vetch is consulting in this book trying to help Bassett and others keep up so it's sort of like it's kind of been talked about in some interviews and things like that so we know he's very very crucial to this and we know he's very key with what happens after moore's run um so there is definitely um a, a, len ween is the editor and he's doing a really great job of just trusting these individuals trusting them to st- tell a very interesting and dynamic story and it just really pays off uh, uh, just just immensely. If you get a chance to catch this, it's just it's beautiful. So as he starts to go through the next day, and he's basically um, explaining sort of this autopsy process that he's going to um, go through, right? And you know, you're you're thinking to yourself, well, what does he want to find? What is what is Swamp Thing? I mean, literally, he's like just a giant plant, right? And it's like, well, no, he was a human. So what are we going to find? I think is what is interesting and. Again, I think what Moore is doing is he's trying to redefine everything, right? By using this character, who who is the Floronic Man. And we're going to learn more about him in just a moment. And uh, as we go through the story of the autopsy, we're going to go through different moments where he's kind of pulling out body parts, right? So he's pulling out things where you're like, I don't even know what this is. This is like, this is a brain. It's all, it's like a leathery skull, but it's like, well, a bullet wouldn't actually hurt this thing. Like, I don't understand. This is like a useless heart. There's no real life 
of this thing. These are pseudo kidneys. What? So he's piecing together that, and, and, and Moore is communicating this and the art with Bissett's art. He's taking you on the journey with this guy's face because you're going on this. The, the way this is drawn with the way the black is used is the, it just it, the art and the and the dialogue, whether you read it or just look at pictures, you can feel exasperation. You can feel frustration. It's not making sense. I don't understand. This is not this is not adding up to what I thought it was going to be. So the story moves along and then you start to see him processing stuff and that we don't just waste time. We don't waste a whole bunch of text boxes. Instead, we come up with a dynamic and interesting way of communicating with the reader. We put him in the shower with some jagged panels and we, re we reveal who Floronic Man is. We reveal more of what we're dealing with. We're not just dealing with just some random scientists. And there are other panels that show this, but this is where it really gets interesting. And you start to see things make sense. He's starting to figure things out. And we're starting to make, we're, spart we're starting to get some clarity on what's going on and who everybody is. And then we get sort of like the backstory. We get really the, the nuts and bolts and the meat of what actually happened to Alec Holland. And it's like, well, he was dead. So then it starts to go through and he's piecing together the fact of, wait a minute, if this has happened and I have all of this stuff, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. And I, I love the fact that the top of the page and look at that, James, how much it just jumps off at you with the contrast of the, yeah, the fire. I love, I love that contrast from, from the color on top to the black and white at the bottom. Oh, I like that contrast. Yeah, this is burning the life away into a black and white death of decomposition, right? It's just, it's totally uh, just a beautiful book in so many ways. And then we get kind of like our big reveal. Rebirth. And what this thing actually is. Because, see, the, the old man, the rich guy, thinks he's all smart, that it's dead, nothing he can do about it. So when Floronic Man is figuring this out, he kind of... The, the old man just kind of dismisses him. He thinks he's got all the answers. He doesn't need this guy anymore. So he, he starts sort of like sabotaging the situation, turns the heater on. He's going to thaw swamp thing out. He's going to turn swamp thing loose. And he's just going to kind of like, well, if this old man won't listen to me, I'll just kind of let the story kind of lie out there. Maybe swamp thing. And I, you know, we'll see what happens. Right. And you can see the new swamp thing. You can see what swamp thing is and will be. And it's like, you know, quote, we thought that the swamp thing was Alec Holland. Somehow it transformed to a plant. It wasn't. It was a plant that thought it was Alec Holland. It's like, oh. So Alan Moore is twisting the swamp thing story, the swamp thing mythos on its head. It's not he a dude. Go ahead. He basically flips the script where we, where we thought Alec Holland, we thought Swamp Thing was a man that was turned into a plant-like creature. It's actually mm -hmm. is a plant that now has been turned into a human-like creature. Yep. And now it's aware of that. So as it starts to come, come alive, as it's thawing out, and you can see all of this different transformation taking place, and he's explaining that the old man has no idea what he's done here. He has no idea that he has embarked on a journey that is not going to give him answers that he wants. None of this is going to work on another human. There's something very special about all this. Well, what's special is it was a plant all along, and now we're going to turn that plant loose. So once it becomes aware and alive, and you can see it emerge, and just, oh, Stephen Bissett, that detail on those arms with the moss and the pieces and the raggedness and all of those elements. And it's like, it, it, it is aware. See the book is open right in front of him. The notes are right there. It knows now it's true origin. And it's true story. And it says, and walking pile of mold and lichen and clotted weeds that thinks it's a rational man. And it's like, no, it's not. He knows now the truth. And it emerges as the monster, the true beast and creature. And it says, I'm thinking about the old man. 
I'm thinking about the cracking of his joints as he runs. So the old man is just doomed. And you can see how it turns into a horror story very, very quickly. And then, of course, he's just he is just a beast because he says, but if he's read my notes, of course, he's read the notes and you can see the the move of just this, this the tenacity of this creature. And then, of course, there in the middle of this page, you have the callback to the cover because he's just a ghost, a ghost dressed in weeds. And I wonder how he'll take it. Well, we know how he's taking it. And then he goes, yeah. and I wonder how the old man will take it because, see, the scientist is getting his revenge by making sure that there's no escape. So he's rigged up the computer. There was a quick panel and it, it was just one little moment where he has his hand on these computers and you realize that what he's done is he's taken control of the security system. So the old man can't get out. The old man is trapped to be in front of the monster. He's going to be within reach. And now the monster is there to consume him. And that's what you get on the next page. It's like he'll pound, he'll hammer, he'll wheeze and he'll scream. He will not be able to comprehend that this could be happening to him. The old reptile, which is what the, what the guys called the science, the old man. And there will be blood. And it just keeps going. And he kind of lifts, Swamp Thing kind of pulls him into his bosom and kind of lifts him. And then you see the feet come up and it just says, just the dying. And that's kind of how we leave things. Um there as we move on because the story becomes more about the floronic man journey the swamp thing existing um i don't want to get too much into it because i want people to read it and enjoy it but this book it's not as cheap as the ones i would want to pick but it's cheaper than you would expect because actually the issue before this is the expensive one because that's the one that alan moore starts writing on uh it just well, has again, so many this, layers this of issue greatness. Plays, th- this issue plays back to to that Batman issue I did with Jim Starlin, the one the, the Fatal Wish, where I said what Starlin did was masterful in that he injected something new into the origin of Batman that completely changes everything, but it didn't change anything at all. All the past stuff still happened the way it happened. It wasn't. It did. He didn't like retcon stuff out of existence. And say, well, that never happened or that was a lie. It didn't. None of that. Everything happened as it did. Just but now with this new information going forward, you look at the character in a completely new light, and that's what Moore does here with Swamp Thing. All the previous stuff, the stuff with Bernie Wrightson and, and Len Wein, and all the other stuff before, and the stuff with Tom Yates and all that. All that happened just as it happened in the books. But now he's injected this new information to you. You thought that Alec Holland was a man who got transformed by the swamp because of the chemicals he was in. He was on fire and he was burning and he fell into the swamp water and it it altered his his body and made a man into a swamp creature. No, no, no. The man died and his soul entered into the marsh and the marsh created a body for him. And so now there is a, a creature of moss and, and, and algae that has the soul of a man. And it completely changes everything about the character, yet nothing has changed because he's still Swamp Thing. He still does what he does. It's just the only difference now is in the mind of Alec Holland himself. Mm-hmm. Because now where Alec Holland before was trying to say, I want to cure myself and become a human again, he now knows there is no going back. This is what I am now forever. I'm a monster. Yeah. 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 And the journey is interesting because they're going to start revealing the elements of what that reality actually looks like and how it shapes up by the Floronic man. He, he takes on more of the villain role now as he's trying to experiment on himself. So he's sort of like trying to find a way to steal Swamp Thing stuff. So to me, this is the pinnacle and the key book to build a film around or build a story around because now you have decided everything that you need in place to move forward. So that was my pick. I hope it's one that you guys like James. I don't know. I thought it's a classic to me. I love it so much. It, it, well, it is. It's, it's, you know, everyone, anyone who's read, read the book, I tell you that, that that's probably one of the best swamp thing issues ever done is that issue. Agreed. So, and, Agreed. you know, and again, just like as always, my, my friend, we, we kind of tie it together. <laughs> Both our stories Inadvertently. are very, very much emotional mine on like the the personal family level yours on a much higher level you know dealing with like you know the reality and your perceptions of self versus mine where it's much more the the, the personal of of of, of the, the personal of a family interaction and 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 the, and the the realities of life but both of them very emotionally drawn stories in our picks this week or this this yep. this this time out yeah 
And for those of you at home that are keeping track, we do not coordinate that. We do not coordinate it all. He does tell me what he's going to do. Uh, I pick, but I don't base it on the story. I usually just have already gotten something picked. So well, with that, folks, I hope that you are enjoying our comic book talk. Our why is it great? We'd love to actually get some more recommendations and feedback from you guys. If you've never checked out this book, the John Byrne run on Fantastic Four, the Swamp Thing run by Alan Moore, these kinds of things. This is this is must read stuff. This is the gold standard of some great stuff. There's great art, but there's also more importantly than anything else, there's great, great storytelling. So I think you'll love it. Uh, James, my friend, that's been awesome, man. It's always great hanging out with you. It's always fun do- talking comic books with you, my friend. So we'll be doing it again next time. Just want to reiterate on Pops is if, if you like this, make sure you give it a like down there. Subscribe to his channel so you don't miss any of your future videos. And please give us some comments, guys. If you got some recommendations and stuff you'd like to talk us talk about, we'll take a look at those. You know, we, we want to hear from you because, you know, you guys are what we're doing all this for. So, you know, give us your thoughts. We want to know what you think and, uh, you know, hit us up with some comments. Listen, man, thank you so much. It's always great chatting with you. It's always great talking comic books. Stuff. Always a good time. Always a good time. So thank you, my friend. Sorry about any of the technical issues that are out there, folks. But listen, we thank you for you being here. We love having you. Take care till next time. Be blessed. Where I'm Pops. We're talking bass fishing off the Station Club. Ultraverse on sale today. Comic book store. Let's go. They couldn't be there on 38 for the launch of that super guy or in 62 for the launch of that spider guy, but they can be there now for the birth of the Ultraverse. Mine! That way! Prime, hard case, first editions in comic shops June 16th. To enter to win one of 200 special edition posters, call this number now. Would that be my spider sense returning? Who's that? He's back. Way to go. Don't let those overgrown tin men keep you down. What? Just too many of the big guys for you, buddy. What? What? Hold on tight. Can Spidey handle the Sentinel's blast? Oh. Grab a copy of this month's Spider-Man. Marvel Comics, it's mayhem for your mind.